Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Mark Gardner, and I'm standing in for Andrew Edwards, who's meant to be um, hosting this um, real seminar series today. But anyway, here goes. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Glenn Bellis, who is an uh, entomologist with the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. That's a Commonwealth Government Department. And also recently, he's become an adjunct associate professor, is that right? Yeah. At the university. So um, <clears throat> basically, we've given a series of talks. Um, like last week, I gave a talk of, um, on the a, a general overview of the North Australian quarantine strategy, which I also work for and some of my other colleagues here work for. And today, Glenn's going to talk about some a specific taxonomic group. So, um, you know, it's sort of the big picture and um, this is the smaller picture and what we're really on about, I, um, myself and Glenn and the rest of my colleagues here, is we're looking to develop some collaborations at the Charles Darwin University. So, yeah, um, Glenn, um, many years in the Northern Territory, 30, mm, 27. 27 years working for the department, so a very um, long-term employee, and he's going to talk to us today about research on biting midges. Okay. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. That's why we signed you guys up as adjuncts, so you can do seminars yeah. and introduce yourself. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't part of the gig that I remember. Okay. So it, just a bit of an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. First of all, I'll explain what biting midges are and what they are not, and then why most people study biting midges, a bit of a summary of their biology, the fact that they transmit uh, pathogens to people and animals and how we assess that, a bit of work that we've been doing on taxonomy and then a bit of a summary of some current projects that I'm involved with and the potential for some collaboration with some staff or students here. So first up, what are biting midges? They're a type of fly, they belong to this family, the Anna, how do you, we pronounce that now? The Ceratobagonidae. So worldwide there's about there's over 6,000 species of, of these things in 111 genera, but only four of those actually feed on vertebrate blood. Most of the others just feed on um, insects. All four genera of the ones that uh, feed on vertebrate blood are present in Australia. And the most important of those is this genus Culicoides that I've been, that I focus on. So th there's a, a photo of, of one of these things biting a, a caterpillar. That's, a, that's not a Culicoides, that one. Okay, so one of the first myths I would like to bust is that biting midges and sandflies are different beasts. Over here, we've got the, the true sandfly, and they belong to the uh, subfamily Phlebotomenae of the psychoda, which are the moth flies. They're, they're bloodsuckers, and they are quite nasty. The ones we have in Australia don't tend to attack people. They're mostly reptile biters. So if you're getting bitten by something in Australia, it's almost certainly not one of these, more likely to be one of these biting midges, culicoides, or one of the other genera that we have. So a bit of the biology of uh, culicoides, anyone that's been bitten by them would know that they're small. Actually in North America, the common name for them is no see -em because you can't see them when they're, they're biting you. And I reckon that they'd walk, I haven't tried it, but I reckon they'd walk three abreast through a, a normal fly screen. The, how long the adults live for varies between species, obviously, but generally speaking, less than a month in the tropics. I think it'd be quite a bit shorter than that, perhaps two or three weeks. They breed in a variety of habitats, including rotting plants, tree holes, animal dung, and wet soil. Some of the most important species that we have in Australia breed in, that's a cow dung pet there, if anyone's asking. That's what they, they breed in. They're very sensitive to low humidity. So even in places where they can survive in places where the humidity is very low, but they'll be getting down under tussocks of grass and places like that where it's nice and humid. Because if we keep them in the lab, if we don't keep them at 80% humidity, they die. Most species mate in swarms. So swarms are like collections of males that usually about that sort of size, I suppose, usually at sunset, they'll swarm over a marker on the ground and the males will just all congregate together. And I think the, the general mode is that females fly at random through the swarm and the males pounce on them as they, as they do that. Not all of them do that. Some of them will mate on the host. And usually the ones that mate on the host, the morphology of the male is similar to the female because instead of looking for a swarm, it's designed to look for the, the host the same as the female is. 
They're very good at being carried long distances on the wind, which is why they're a concern for our department, because they do fly in here from uh, overseas, Indonesia and Timor and New Guinea. And most species are active at dusk, dawn or at night, but we do have some species that are active during the day. So that's just a bit of a, a summary of the life cycle of these things. Eggs, larvae, pretty that. standard fly life cycle, pupae, adult, they feed, they digest the blood to produce more eggs and they're off again. So why do people study such small insects? Most of the research that happens with Culicoides is because they do transmit diseases to people, oh, livestock, mammals and birds. And it's probably this, their impact on livestock is, is where most of the gen, uh, research is generated. But some species can cause allergic reactions in people and in animals. There's a couple of conditions, one called Queensland itch in Australia, and overseas they call it sweet itch. And this is a, a reaction to the bite of the, the, the midge in the skin. And they can be a severe nuisance to people and livestock. The Scots are always going on about the Scottish midge being really bad. And here you would have a similar problem if you go fishing in mangroves, particularly at sunset. You'll know all about them in Northern Australia. And their ability to travel long distances makes them a, a biosecurity risk, which is why our department is, is probably more, most interested in them. So in Australia, we have a thing called the National Arbovirus Monitoring Program, which as you can see is all over the country. All of these crosses represent where we have a trapping site for Culicoides, so that we've got a bit of an idea of which species are where in Australia. So the idea of this program is to map the distribution of Culicoides and livestock arboviruses. So all of these crosses here are where we have a trapping site for Culicoides, and it's pretty much the same for, we have uh, herds of cattle, they test, take blood samples from and test those for the presence of viruses. The different colours here are the map that's produced for one of the, the most important viruses that's transmitted is called blue tongue virus. And so the yellow area is where blue tongue virus is established and endemic. Then you've got a, a 50 kilometre buffer zone here. And then you've got this area down here where there are no vectors and no virus. And the idea here is that if you want to export live animals from Australia to a country that doesn't want to import animals that might have blue tongue virus, they can take them safely from this area in Southern Australia, but they can't take them from here because there's, there's a chance that they would be importing animals that have got, got the virus. Of course, some markets aren't concerned about that. Indonesia, we export a lot of live cattle to Indonesia and they're not concerned about, about the viruses because all of our viruses have come from Indonesia originally anyway. So talking about the long distance movement, this is the, the, what we're faced with in the top end here. These sort of distances between the nearest neighbors and during the wet season, we have these summer monsoons that are blowing uh, winds across here. And people have done some wind trajectory analysis and they say that the, a parcel of air can leave any of these islands here and be over in Australia within 30 hours. And it'll pick up small insects I think the documents, plant spores already uh, are also coming in here on, on the wind over these distances. Obviously over here, the distance is shorter. So it's, it's much more likely that things are going to come through this, this pathway here. So talking about pathways, the, the guru, Alan Dice, come up with this theory of how Culicoides come came into Australia. We have quite a few species, Asian species established in the north of Australia. And based on the distribution of those things, this was the theory he came up with. They come into the top end of the Northern Territory. From here, they spread eastwards to Queensland and down to New South Wales or west into Western Australia. They also go, then travel up on the Southeast trade winds, which blow over there during the dry season, up into New Guinea and then out into the Pacific. But we also found a pathway that goes directly into New Guinea from Asia and then down into to Queensland from there. So there's two ways of them coming into Australia. That's just a, a snapshot of, of a wind, wind pattern when there was a cyclone over here. And you can see the winds are coming here during that wet season. They're picking stuff up here, potentially blowing it onto the Kimberley or Northern Territory coast. And similarly here from New Guinea down to, to Northern Queensland or over in Eastern Arnhem Land. So in the past 15 years, the NAMP program has documented seven incursions of Asian species into Northern Australia. These are species that have not been reported in Australia before. 
Most of these were only single specimens and they've since died out. There's been at least one that has established itself in northern Queensland during my time here. But almost certainly specimens of other species arrive all the time, but we don't know because those species are already present in Australia. So we can't tell if it's, if the specimen we've collected is from Australia or it's just come in from Asia, unless it brings a, a new virus with it, in which case we'll detect the virus. So probably the, the thing of most direct import to most people is the fact that, um, hey, can we get rid of that there? How do we do that or we can't get rid of that? No. Yeah, that, that just goes to the next slide. Oh, we'll put up with it. So biting midges as human pests. So there's more than 140 species of culicoides in Australia, but less than 15 of those bite people. Most of them bite frogs or birds or mammals. And a lot of them are fairly host specific. And the, the ones that bite uh, people are usually generalist feeders and they'll bite anything that's going around. But they seem to be, a, they're all distributed uh, coastally. So they're either in mangroves or estuaries. So if you go further and further and say 50K inland, there'll be midges there, but they won't bite you because all the, all the bitey ones are around the, the coast. Another myth I'd like to explode here is that the, the reaction, we get these sort of reactions like this. That reaction is to the saliva that the insect inject when they feed not to, there's a, a rumours going around that it's caused by when they urinate on you. And they often do urinate because I think they want to get everything out of their abdomen so they can fit as much blood in as possible. So they'll squeeze whatever's in their abdomen out while they're feeding. But that's not what causes this reaction. It's actually the, the saliva that they inject while they're, they're feeding. And if you get a quick reaction to, to the bite, you'll get a little, a small red spot. This is what happens to me. It's usually not very severe. It goes away. It might hurt for a couple of hours, but then it goes away. But if you don't get a reaction until one or two days afterwards, you'll end up with something like this. Whoop. This sort of thing, weeping pustules and blisters and, and uh, very nasty. So if we get on to culicoides as vectors of disease, we'll first talk about the, the types of transmission that's done by biting flies. We have bought two types, biological transmission and mechanical transmission. So biological transmission is where the insect ingests a blood meal that's got the pathogen in it. The pathogen then infects the insect, circulates throughout the insect, ends up in either the salivary glands, so that then the next time the insect feeds, it's, it's uh, spreading, uh, transmitting the, the pathogen to the host it feeds on, and that insect will remain infected for life, and it'll keep producing, the virus will keep producing in the salivary glands. It'll, every time it feeds, it'll then transmit that uh, pathogen. Alternatively, it can infect the ovaries and then the pathogen is transmitted to any eggs that it lays and the next generation comes out and they're all infected. Uh, da, da, but this, the thing, thing, important thing about this biological transmission is that it takes time for the pathogen to replicate in the insects. It might take seven days or so for the, the period between when it ingests the blood meal and when it's actually excreting virus in its saliva. If we compare that to mechanical transmission where the pathogen doesn't replicate in the insect, it just remains infective on the mouth parts. And this is the equivalent of a hypodermic syringe goes into me and then it goes into Alan and whatever disease I've got ends up in Alan. That's mechanical, that's mechanical treatment. You're welcome, Alan. That's mechanical transmission. And, and that usually doesn't last as long. Like the biologically infected insects will remain infected for life, whereas these have a very limited, perhaps up to a week maybe in some species. So biting flies use two methods of taking blood. We have the siphon feeders, which are the mosquitoes, which have the equivalent of a hypodermic needle, which goes under your skin and probes around until it finds a blood vessel. And then I'll suck blood directly out of the, the blood vessel. And then you have pool feeders, which are the midges, march flies, and most other biting flies. And what they do, this is the midge mouth parts here. They've got these two saw blades on the end of their thing, and they get in there and they hack away at the skin. And then blood pools into the into the wound and then they suck up the blood from, from the wound. And these are generally a more painful bite. As anyone who's been bitten by a March fly can testify, they do hurt. And so they're usually better at mechanical transmission because the fly will come and it'll start feeding on me and I'll chase it off because it bites me. And then it goes and bites Alan and it gives him any diseases that I've got because it's still got the blood on its mouth parts. So there's no escaping it for you, Alan, I'm afraid. 
So Culicoides as vectors, there's more than 1,300 species of Culicoides worldwide, but so far only 86 of those have been associated with any uh, transmission of any pathogens. And these are, these are the range of pathogens. So there's nematodes, there's protozoa, and arboviruses. Arbovirus is an acronym for arthropod-borne virus, and they're much more well studied because they're usually the more pathogenic of, the, of all of those, the things that they transmit. Most of these pathogens infect livestock. Because there's an economic interest in doing the research on livestock. And so almost certainly there'd be many pathogens of native animals that have never been studied or discovered. Only one virus and one of these nematodes infect people, and that's in South America. We don't have any of that going on in Australia or even in Asia. And most research is focused on biological vectors of livestock or human pathogens. There's not much known about mechanical transmission of pathogens by culicoides, but I'd, I'd guess that it almost certainly is, is happening. So if we're going to prove a species is a biological vector, the species has to satisfy these four criteria. First of which is you need to detect the pathogen in a field collected uh, specimen. So there's obviously the pathogen is in the, the wild population of the insect. That's the first one. Second one is you have to demonstrate that if you feed that insect, feed a, a clean insect on an infected uh, blood meal, it will become infected by, by that feeding. And that, that's a laboratory study. Similarly, demonstrate that it's able to transmit that pathogen by bite, so in its saliva. And the fourth one is a bit wishy-washy, but that's accumulation of field evidence to confirm that there is an association between the insect, the host, and the pathogen. So I'll just go through those each one at a time. So the first one is recovery of pathogen. Traditionally, this, this required isolation or multiplication of the live pathogen in the laboratory, but more recently the molecular people are now able to detect the DNA or the RNA of the, the pathogen in uh, insects collected in ethanol. This is quite, quite laborious, collecting these things here. You have to collect either the insects live or in something like saline that's not going to kill the pathogen because you want to make the uh, reproduce the pathogen and make it replicate in the lab. Whereas these ones here we can collect straight into ethanol and that's much easier to deal with than that. The, the potential issues with the, the DNA detection is the amplification of non-specific or trace amounts of DNA and give you a false positive result. And you need to calibrate your DNA test to make sure that you're not getting these false, false results. Second criteria, you can't see the start of it there, but that's demonstration that the insect will become infected by after feeding on an infective vertebrate. So this requires bringing some insects, into, live insects into the laboratory usually uses insects from a colony, or you can collect live insects in the field, because very few species of culicoides have actually been colonized. They're quite difficult to, to maintain in a colony. So we feed insects on the inflected blood meal, keep them alive to allow time for the pathogen to replicate, and then we test them for the presence of the pathogen. Understandably, these, these things are quite expensive and detailed, and you don't want to be doing that with a lot of, a lot of species to try and target the number of species that you're doing those sort of, that sort of work with. Similarly with this, this is where, where we want to test if the insect is, is transmitting the, the pathogen by bite. That's another, another laboratory study with a, a very expensive and you don't want to do that with a lot of number of species. You can use naturally infected insects, either ones infected by trials in the previous one where we're trying to infect them in the lab, or you can bypass all of the the barriers and the midgut and things by injecting directly into the thorax of the insect and the virus or pathogen will replicate in the insect. So low infection and survival rates in the lab means that you've got to start off with a lot of, lot of a large number of insects to end up with a couple at the end that you can test to see if they're transmitting virus or not. Using artificial infection is less natural, but it does allow you to, to start off with more insects. And again, this is expensive and requires technical expertise. So the last criteria is this accumulation of um, epidemiological evidence associating your insect with your, your host and your, your pathogen. So there's four aspects to this. The first one is that a species that's more abundant is more likely to be a vector than something that's rare. It's all a numbers game. 
The seasonality of your vectors should be similar to that of your pathogen. If your vector numbers are peaking in the wet season, but your pathogen incidence is peaking in the dry season, it's probably not that, this, this species is probably not gonna be heavily involved in transmitting that pathogen. The, the seasonality and also the distribution of the pathogen and vector should be similar. So if you've got a, the pathogen is much more widespread than your vector, then that vector is probably not going to be solely responsible for transmitting the pathogen. If your vector is really widespread and your pathogen is, has got a narrow distribution, then that species is probably not going to be acting as the vector because it should have taken that, that uh, disease out, out through its whole, its entire uh, distribution. Host range of the vector is the last one and, and super important. If the insect's not biting the host of the pathogen, it's not going to, first of all, it's not going to get infected with the pathogen. And secondly, it's not going to transmit the virus to the pathogen. So if you're dealing with a pathogen of cattle, you, there's not much point teach, uh, testing bird feeders for that because they're not going to get exposed to, to the pathogen. They're not going to be an important vector. How do we measure some of those things there? So the abundance, seasonality and distribution can be done by setting light traps near hosts of the pathogen being studied. You can also collect directly from hosts by uh, uh, vacuuming and then you, you'll find out um, what numbers of, of and species are attacking the host from, from that sort of data. But of course, all this stuff, you get a huge variation in trap collection sizes. So it makes it really hard to do statistical analysis. You need to collect a lot of collections to get some significant uh, statistics to support whatever, whatever you're saying. So the host range, most species of Pulicoides feed on vertebrate blood, but there are three that are known to feed on engorged mosquitoes. So they're still feeding on vertebrate blood, but they're letting the mosquito do the hard work of attacking the cow or horse or person or whatever. And then they'll go and attack the mosquito and they'll take the blood out of the mosquito's abdomen. Most species of Pulicoides prefer a narrow range of hosts like we've got some species that, that seem to really only bite cows, buffalo and horses. You get other species that specialize on birds. I'm sure you have species that specialize on reptiles and frogs as well. Species with a limited host range are better vectors because they're more likely in the first place to bite the vector that's got the pathogen. And then once they are infected, every time they feed, they'll be transmitting that pathogen to a susceptible host. It's not much good if you get a species that bites cows, dogs, pigs and chickens, if it picks up a cow pathogen, the next blood meal it take might be a chicken, the one after that might be a dog, one after that might be a pig. So you're, you're diluting the chances of, of transmitting the virus because that thing has got a, a wide host range. So things that are transmitting viruses to cattle, the species that only feed on cattle are gonna be much more efficient vectors than, than ones with a wider host range. So if we're screening for vector species, the criterion two and three, which are the two laboratory-based laboratory studies, very labor intensive and expensive. So we don't do that. We don't want to do that with 20 species. We want to do that with one or two species. So how do we find out which species, the one or two that we should focus on? We can do that by investigating criterion three and four from field collections. And that's the way that a lot of this stuff is done. You first of all do this to, to narrow down your number of species you're, you want to test to, to a number that's more achievable. Moving on from vectors, the other thing that uh, we're involved with is taxonomy of culicoides. I'm sure Alan would agree that taxonomy underpins all research. If you don't know what species you're dealing with, you can't really do any research because you may be dealing with more than one species. The described species well, there are many described species worldwide, but there are also many undescribed species, even in Australia. We've, in Australasia, we've got 145 described species and 120 undescribed species. So there's a lot of work to be done on the taxonomy front for Culicoides. And this is not counting since the advent of the molecular people who've got in there and just upset things entirely by deciding that one thing that we were calling one species is actually 12 different species. And the species diversity, in Australasia anyway, decreases eastwards into the Pacific. And some islands like notably New Zealand have no species of Culicoides. This is a bit of a summary of the species of Culicoides on all the islands in the Pacific. And you can see we've got big numbers here on mainland Asia, Australia, New Guinea. But as you, as you fan out here, numbers drop right off. You've got zero here, zero here, zero up here, even down Cocos Island, we don't have any down there. I think that's probably not an uncommon distribution for, for species distributions of, 
not only insects, but probably other things as well. But the, for culicoides, that's certainly the case. So how do we identify culicoides? The tradition, traditionally, it's all been done like other things by morphology. We can use the patterns of, of pale markings on the wings here. We can use the uh, sensory organs on the antennae. We can use the shape and sensory organs on the, the palp here, or we can use the, the boy bits here. But the, the important thing here is that all of this requires fairly specialist training and knowledge of the species involved and what the differences are between them. And in Australia, there's, I don't know, less than half a dozen people, I suppose, that, that have got an interest in, in doing that. Molecular analysis is, is a fairly recent uh, uh, event to Culicoides work, particularly in Australia. I think we've been going maybe 13 years now with it. It's comparing the DNA of specimens to determine species limits or relationships between species. The most commonly one used is this barcode region of the cytochrome oxidase 1 mitochondria. It offers an alternative method of identifying species without going through that laborious morphological uh, suite of characters but it does require a representative library of sequences from accurately identified specimens. And that's the, that's the real caveat on any of this DNA barcoding work. Public databases are not always reliable. People often put stuff on there that hasn't been identified uh, adequately. And uh, I mean, I've seen some cases where you get some of these clades here and there are four different species listed in the one, the one clade because people haven't taken the time to identify <coughs> their specimens uh, accurately. And, but the other thing we've noticed with this CO1 is not much good for grouping things. Like here you've got a group of species, you might say that that's, that would form a species group or a subgenus. It's not so, not so useful CO1 for doing that, in culicoides anyway. So what we tend to do is this thing called integrative taxonomy where we're combining multiple analysis to look at the species limits and relationships. So we're, most commonly we're using morphology and uh, molecular analysis and we try to use multiple genes as well when we're doing the molecular work. So the taxonomic research in Australia has mostly been morphological to date. There was the guru Alan Dice published this book back in 2007 which is was a, a checklist I suppose of all the species in Australasia and photographs of their wings because often the wings can be useful in identifying these species. So he, he catalogued 265 species into eight subgenera and 25 groups, but most of these groups have not been formally described and, and he's passed on now. So that work is going to be done by someone else. I've, I've taken on some of that and we're working on uh, revising six of those subgeneric groups now using morphology and uh, molecular work. So I might just move on to what, what projects are happening currently in Australia with MIDGE research. So this is uh, part of the National Arborvirus Monitoring Program I spoke about earlier. And we're doing it with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry who are doing the DNA work. We're determining the diversity and abundance of culicoides in Australia. We're trying to produce identification aids to all species because they don't exist for all species in Australia at the moment. We'd like to revise the taxonomy of all species if possible, and produce uh, a barcode library for all species, or at least the ones that are commonly encountered by uh, during this program. More recently, we've started some, some research into the potential of culicoides to transmit this virus called African horse sickness virus. This virus was confined to Africa until sometime last year that turned up out of the blue in Thailand. Probably someone smuggled in some zebra or something. We're not quite sure how it got into Thailand, but it got into Thailand. And of course, that's put the wind up everyone over in this part of the world. This is a very nasty disease of horses, got like a 90% mortality rate in horses. And we certainly don't want that to come here. It's very closely related to another virus, blue tongue virus. And blue tongue virus has been shown to come down in waves from uh, Southeast Asia into Northern Australia. And the fear is that if we have vectors that are capable of transmitting this thing, they could bring this disease down, it could become established in Northern Australia. So the big unknown with this in Northern Australia is we don't really know what species of Culicordi bite horses in Australia. 
most of the research that's been done so far has been on cattle and buffalo and blue tongue virus. We've not really done much work on horses. So that's part of this project is to try and find the species that attack uh, horses and cattle in Australia. We're doing that two ways. One is by vacuuming horses. This is a uh, photo of Neville Hunt out vacuuming some horses down at um, Beatrice Hill, trying to find out what species of, of midge are biting those horses. The pr problem he's got is that he can do quite, quite uh, happily do collections during the daytime, like before sunset now. But once the sun goes down, all the mosquitoes come out and that horse will not stand still while he's getting flogged by mosquitoes. So we're, we're finding it hard to do this work after sunset down at um, Beatrice Hill. The other thing we're doing is where any blood fed specimens that are coming in our light trap collections, we're giving them to the DNA people and they're testing the DNA of that blood to see if it's fed on horses or cows or, or possums or anything like that. And the next part of that project will be once we know which species are attacking horses and cattle in Australia, we'll then try to infect those midges with virus and see if they're competent at becoming infected with, with the virus. Some overseas work that's going on. We're doing some collaboration with the, the Yunnan Tropical and Subtropical Animal Viruses Disease Laboratory. For people who don't know where Yunnan is, it's in the south part of China here, and it shares a border with Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar. It's a very diverse, province ecologically. The northern part here borders Tibet, so that's very high altitude. We've got yaks and, and snow-covered mountains up here. And down here, it's um, tropical rainforest next to Southeast Asia. So the diversity of species there is just mind-blowing, just in that one, one province. So what we're trying to do here is to, the ultimate aim is to try and sort out what species are acting as vectors of the important livestock viruses in Yunnan province. And we're doing that initially by sorting out the diversity, abundance and seasonality of culicoides on livestock farms in Yunnan. And then we're testing some of those species for, to see if they're carrying the virus. So these are criteria three and four, which I discussed earlier. We'll also produce a library of DNA barcodes for all species that we collect up there. It was one of the problems in a place like China, there's even fewer people there, they don't have a national program like we do for monitoring midges or arboviruses. So there's very few people there that are working on the morphology of culicoides or can identify culicoides. So if we can produce this library of DNA barcodes based on reliably identified specimens, theoretically anyone with a DNA machine should be able to identify their, their specimens that they collect. And if we get time, we'll try and revise the subgenera and species that are present in there using integrative taxonomy much as what we're doing for in Australia. Thailand has recently become tropical because of this <clears throat> African horse sickness, but also they've got outbreaks of leishmania, which is a protozoa that affects people. And so there are some people in, in Thailand are coming down with this leishmania and that parasite has been found in some species of culicoides. So we're trying to establish which species of culicoides are involved in, in the leishmania. Similarly, the African horse sickness outbreak they had there, we're trying to find out which species bite horses in Thailand. That is similar to this, the project we've got in Australia, will be repeated in Thailand. And they've also got this other disease that's just turned up there called lumpy skin disease of cattle. This is a thing transmitted by insects. The vectors are not clear at all. They could well be midges. And so we'll, we'll do some work to see if we can establish if midges are also transmitting that, that disease there. And Thailand has a similar issue to Australia, with uh, to China, with very few people able to identify midges. There's one, as far as I know, in the country that can identify midges. So we'll also try and produce these barcode libraries to help out Thai researchers identify their specimens. Ditto for Singapore. Once the outbreak of horse sickness was reported in Thailand, Singapore, which has a large horse racing industry, we got very concerned about uh, the virus <laughs> through Malaysia into Singapore. So there's, and, and there's very little known about the midges of Singapore. I think there were eight species recorded there previously. So they've started doing similar work to uh, what we're doing in Thailand uh, and here on, on looking for things that might be vectors of horse sickness in, in Singapore and we'll also produce uh, barcode libraries for them. Uh, we've, we've had a long uh, association with Timor, the National Directorate of Quarantine and Biosecurity in Timor, and we've been looking at uh, diversity and abundance of culicoides in Timor-Leste, which is the eastern half of 
of the island and ultimately we'd like to revise the taxonomy of all the species and again produce barcode libraries for all the species but so far we've I think doubled the number of species that are known from Timor. I think this is uh, more a, a reflection of how much work had been done there before rather than new species arriving since we've been studying there. Also got some projects going in New Zealand. You may remember that New Zealand has no Culicoides, so this project is other vectors, other uh, ceratopogonids, midges in, in New Zealand. New Zealand's worried about Culicoides because uh, Australia over here could be sending some Culicoides their way with this blue tongue virus, which is a disease of sheep, which they don't want in their country. So they've got a monitoring program, mostly on the Northern Island, but also on the Northern tip down here, monitoring for Culicoides. And their monitoring program produces a lot of ceratopogonids, which they can't identify and they would like to know what they are. So that's what's happening in, in New Zealand. Again, we'll be doing these CO1 barcodes and we'll try and do some work with other genes to look at the generic and subgeneric placement of species by using molecular analysis. So that's what's happening at the moment in Australia and um, overseas projects that I've been involved with. So potential collaboration with, with staff or students here would be to collaborate on any of those existing projects, particularly the taxonomic projects in Australia, because I don't think I'm ever going to finish um, what Alan Dice started. Uh, we could do some more work on assessing the host ranges of Culicoides in Northern Australia. We have that project looking at horse and cattle, but we could take that further and start to look at which marsupials they're biting or which ones are biting frogs or reptiles or birds, because we're really just looking at livestock in the project that we have at the moment. There are a couple of the important livestock pests in Australia and we don't know what the immature habitat of those is. One of those has recently arrived in Queensland and it's creeping its way down the coast but we really don't know what the ultimate distribution would be because we don't know what the immature habitat of that would be. And these species are relatively common around Darwin so it would be a <laughs> neat project for someone to get into that and try and find out where these things are breeding. And of course we're open to other, other ideas. I'm not really involved in any research on human bites at the moment, but that's, if that's something someone's interested in, I'm, I'd be open to doing some work on that. I won't be offering my leg up for uh, feeding any of those things, but if, if anyone's got any ideas for that, <laughs> and we can leave that <laughs> or other, any other ideas that people might have or if they're interested in collaborating with that, or any other questions you've got about images, I'll, I'll see if I can help out. Uh, thanks a lot, Glenn. Um, any questions in the room and also any questions online, please just type them in and we'll get Glenn to respond to them. How do we get the online ones to come up? There is a photo Where's that? Oh, oh there. Okay. Um, Glenn, I had a question. Oh. Um, howdy. I uh, just wondered how you came up with those monitoring sites in the map that had the yellow and the brown areas, like how you, what the decision making around choosing those sites was. So, mm. yep. Thanks. Did anyone hear that question? Penny's asking with this map here, how were these sites chosen? So the objectives of NAMP are to uh, map the distribution of culicoides throughout Australia so that we can get this, this line of the, the diseases that are transmitted by by Culicoides, and also to look for new ones coming in from um, either New Guinea or Indonesia or, or Timor. So most of the, the, these sites here are around this line, and in particular places where people are wanting to export cattle to markets that, are, that don't want to import cattle that are infected with blue tongue virus. So there's, there's quite a lot of, of countries that have that requirement. And so a lot of the, the mapping is, is set up around here. It's not such an issue in, in the NT here because most of the people here sell, sell live cattle to Indonesia. They don't sell them to the Middle East or China or some of these places that are sensitive about blue tongue. So it's not such an issue here. Obviously, in New South Wales, you can see the density of, of trapping sites in New South Wales. They want to know accurate, accurately where that map is because a lot of people down there do export to Korea and, and these places that, have, uh, that are sensitive to it. And then we've got a smattering of ones across the top here, which wind pattern analysis has shown us these are the most likely places where things that are coming in on the wind are, are to arrive. The main hotspots in that analysis were uh, here at Columbaroo, 
Uh, the Tiwi Islands and Coburg, where we've actually got traps up there now, and this very tip of, of Cape York Peninsula. But we also need to have some sites down in the negative zone to convince the trading partners that we do know what we're talking about and that this is the line and that there aren't little pockets of midges and, and virus down in southern Australia. So we've even got a site in Tasmania. Yeah. It's just a quick question. Is it transmitted only through live animals um, or can it be through infected products, meat, stuff like that? Or I imagine that if a culicord is fed on some infected meat, it could become infected, but it's not going to happen because they're not attracted to infected meat. Okay. Yeah. They're not like house flies or anything. Sam, um, sorry, you're supposed to be doing this, Mark. Oh. Sorry, I, I, I had a question. Yes, that's why I got the microphone. Yeah. Do I press this? Oh, I just talk it. Um, are the taxonomists um, all in agreement with each other, or is the do you get a, do you get a, um, one lot of taxonomists having recognizing two species where another? one recognises one, or are there just too few of you to have disputes you've all got to agree because... In Australia, there is, we don't really have those, those debates. No. But is there, have they got the same list of species in China that you might recognise? There are certainly differences in uh, how we interpret a species here compared to what happens in, in Asia. And I, I often have trouble using keys for Asian species and comparing them to what we have in Australia. So, so there are differences in interpretation and that a lot of that I think is down to descriptions and if people have misidentified specimens and based their descriptions on that or the drawings in books and that are not terribly accurate. But I do have a problem using some, some Asian textbooks. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Is it just doing some work on taxonomic lists and okay. trying to find the examples where um, those sorts of disputes have been involved. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't strike it so much until we started doing this work in, in Yunnan. And we've got things there, Chinese species, and I think they're a Southeast Asian thing, but the Chinese think it's something different. But it's, we, we, I suppose we can resolve that by getting DNA of one and the other and prove that they're, they're similar. Getting, getting hold of the type specimens in Chinese institutions can be difficult too. Yeah. Um. I guess the, the info on potential for spread into Australia from other areas gave a bit of information on this, but do you have any idea just kind of based on movements or population connectivity of the um, vectors themselves, sort of how quickly any of these, these, these diseases would be likely to spread if they had an incursion into Australia? Or are there sort of, you know, obvious disjunctions in distribution where you could say, all right, if this came in, this is kind of where we'd expect to have to deal with it and control it. You know, do you sort of have that biogeographical population connectivity information to sort of um, understand sort of spread patterns or where diseases would be limited to if they came in? Well, I think if we knew what the vector was, then that would give us mm. a bit of an idea. Like this one, this, this disease here, this is a map of the disease here, not the vector. But it does closely match the distribution of the vector. So, so that, that will give us an idea of that. But that's taken like 20 years to come up with that, that reliable map like that. So if something like horse sickness came in there, we'd be, we'd be struggling to work out what the ultimate distribution of that would be. First of all, we'd have to try and find out which species is transmitting it and then potentially if it's the same species that transmits blue tongue virus then i suppose this would be the the potential distribution of that virus providing there are horses in all this mm. area it, it all depends on the host it's quite a complicated and scenario. have there been any instances where people have been able to look into kind of spread rate within places of the scale of australia when when these pathogens have moved into new areas too or it's just totally variable um, I don't know that anyone's actually done that, mm. looked at the, the rate of spread of something. New things are coming in here all the time. Darwin in particular is a, a hotspot for new blue tongue viruses coming in. Mm. And they probably would have some idea, certainly within one season, it'll probably go as far as it's going to go and then they tend to die out. Yeah. But they have had ones come through Queensland and they've come down right down into southern Queensland reasonably quickly. Someone probably would know, be able to answer that question, but I'm sorry, it's not me. Um, just in res response to that 
discussion. Uh, we had a um, collaboration a number of years ago when we were in, um, there was a new biological control agent for Mimosa that was just about to arrive. And it was a flea beetle, which is still, which is successfully established. Um, but we had some um, collaborators from CSIRO that were interested in using that uh, deliberate introduction as a model for detecting, for, for um, evaluating spread rates of a new incursion. Um, and so we came and, you know, set up, we went and did plots and tried to, the, the, the essential problem um, in that um, study was that we just didn't have enough of the insect to establish it really rapidly. So we were anticipating much more rapid spread than what actually happened. So it wasn't very exciting results. And I guess if you compare that to something like uh, fall army worm, then you can see there's massive differences between different taxonomic groups in terms of the spread rates, you know. Yeah, sorry, I thought you were only talking about Culicordes born things, but there, oh, uh, other yes. other insects, yeah, there, that has been studied there. Yeah. And the example. Oh, sorry, I thought, yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought it was more general. Was spectacular, <laughs> absolutely spectacular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've got a. Can I can I ask a question? Yeah. While I've got while I've got the mic, um, this is a human health question for you, Glenn. I don't know if you can ask. If you, um, it's common experience in Darwin to have visitors that. Um, go down to the beach and get really, really badly bitten and then come back and have welts all over them. And yet it doesn't seem to affect people that have been here for a while. Is that, do you know why visitors seem to get... I don't know whether you develop some sort of tolerance or immunity. That's sort of a medical, medical question. You'd have to ask a medico, I think. But I, I think you're right. I've, I've noticed the same thing too. It seems to be visitors here seem to be either bitten more often or have a, a more severe reaction to midge bites. Yeah. So I, I agree with your observation, but I'm not quite sure what it is. I don't know whether people here become less attractive to midges or just more tolerant of them. That'd be a good collaborative research project. <laughs> <laughs> Who will put their leg up? <laughs> I know that I've seen studies with mosquitoes where they've tried to compare the attractiveness of pe relative attractiveness of people and they have these Y-shaped tube and someone puts their hand there and someone else puts their hand there and they let mosquitoes go and they count how many mosquitoes go. And that can reliably say this person here is, attracts twice as many mosquitoes as that person there and they're able to rank people from one to ten. But I don't think they really know what it is that makes them. <laughs> And I don't know that that's been, been done with midges. Yeah. One of the horrible things in New Zealand that bites you, they look like harmless and then they reach like anything if you do those items. On the South Island? On the South Island? No, no. <laughs> On the beaches or where are they? They have two bites there that I know of. One is on the beaches on the North Island. And then they have a black fly, which is a different family again, which is most, I thought they're mostly on the South Island though, but I don't really know. North Island as well, yeah. Mm. They're a bit bigger than this, from what I've seen. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Any questions online? Are there any biological controls that you know of for monkeys? Like for example, fruit flies have here as a parasite, um, that's able to get rid of all the other viruses uh, in fruit flies. Is there anything similar for midges? I don't know that anyone's ever found Wolbachia in midges. They've looked for them and they've found <laughs> Arginium, <laughs> what that is or what impact that has. But um, they do have parasites, there's a thing called a mimithid worm. See them. We were looking at some today, actually. They, get in the abdomen, you see them on the adults and they curl around in the abdomen and they do something to the um, hormones and you'll have a mid with a, a male abdomen but a female head like that and I'm presuming they're sterile but it's nearly always associated with this. You know, I think there were studies done in, in the US and that had like a 75% mortality on the larvae. So the ones we're seeing in the adults are just the odd one that survives until the midge becomes an adult. 75% of the midges that have been infected with that thing have died before it even gets to the adult stage. But, but, but what's that? I'm presuming these adults, these infected adults carry around. Yeah, I presume so. 
but I think they, even though it had a 75% mortality, they weren't able to use that as a biocontrol agent to, to control the midge, because the midge that they found that in was one of the nasty pests in North America. But even though they found that, that agent, it, it wasn't, the, I don't know whether they couldn't breed it up to release. Uh, maybe the population would be a lot bigger if there, was, if there wasn't that, that nematode around, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. Um, a Mitch is um, good for anything. <laughs> <laughs> They're good to look at. They're interesting to study. I mean, the, the context I'm asking is, you know, not really it's good for anything, Lou. Well, <laughs> well, they are. They, abs they, they absolutely are. They, 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 they provide food and and things for you know pollination. But the um, the the context of what I'm asking is, you know, a lot of people hate flies. But then, if you took away the flies, then flies are obviously a keystone species for things that eat flies. So, are there things that rely on midges? Well, not pure lacordes, but other serrata have got a midges, pollinate, cocoa, and rubber. So they are pollinators. And I think there's an orchid as well that they pollinate as well. So some of them do some good. They must sustain a population of parasites, brothers, aren't they? Yeah, they do that. They, they probably control populations of a few things as well. That to me, that's it's an interesting looking map. That is that yeah, a map of humidity or something? It's, yeah, a, it's not a pattern that you see in yeah, any other. It pretty much follows the 300 yeah, millimeter rainfall yeah, gradient. Without it's, it's very close to that. It, I mean, it obviously moves every year. Like at the moment, this this has come right over near South Australia. That, that line there, and and down down it has gone down as far almost to Victoria. So it, it fluctuates, and and this map is used yeah. to uh, according to the OIE, the World Animal Health Organization. They've got guidelines, and and they can be, you can declare an area free if there hasn't been any virus there within the last two years. So that's what this map reflects. It's actually an old map, that one. It's just one I pulled out of a previous presentation, so it's not accurate. But you can get an accurate map, which will give you the distribution of the virus over the past two years. And that's what we use to trade. Uh, northern sites are done 12 times a year, so once a month. And then the around this around this area here, it's probably down to uh, six times a year. And then the very southern ones is only four times a year. Just during summer. We do the Northern Territory in Western Australia. There's a laboratory in Brisbane that does most of Queensland, and there's a laboratory in Orange, New South Wales, which does South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria, and Tasmania. And there's equivalent uh, virus work that goes on as well from the, the Sentinel Herd <laughs> program. So a Sentinel Herd is like a group of usually 10 cattle, and they bleed those same cattle once every month to find out when they've... Uh, what they call seroconverted when they've become infected with the virus and that data is used to make, to create this map here. Right, if there's no more questions, um, I'd like you to join me in thanking Glenn for his talk.